As we're starting this new sermon series about finding our calling and purpose in life, I want you to know how we began last week. We began with a fundamental truth, the basic, I mean, this is blocking and tackling stuff, that our calling comes from God. Well, duh. But before we can even start thinking about what our calling is individually and the purpose of what we do, we have to understand every one of us have this universal calling, that we have a calling that we, uh, to, to, to have that calling to be loved by God. You see, before the creation of the universe, God already knew you and loved you. And too often, we get caught up in what we think God wants us to do, but forget what God wants us first to receive. You see, he didn't create us to do something. Adam and Eve had nothing to do other than walk and talk with God. God created them, he created us to receive something. And as a God of God, as a God of love and grace, his desire is that we would receive that love and experience that love. I was amazed last week that how many people came up to me or sent me an email or texted me uh, how hard it is for them to live that calling that they're loved by God. I had no idea that singing Jesus loves me, loves me, would have such a profound impact on people. That tears were shed. Because maybe for the first time they realized God loves them just as they are. You see, our highest priority in life is not to be a husband, a spouse, a wife a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent, to work, to go to school, to learn more about Jesus, to serve others, to give generously of our, our money, our time, our resources, to take care of our kids or our grandkids or our parents or our great-grandkids. Those are all great things. And I pray that you are doing them. But they all flow from that calling that we are loved by God. You see, the greatest thing that we can do ever in life, it's the greatest thing. If you take nothing else in my sermon, this is it. So you can't walk out after this, okay? Or you can't turn me off. The greatest thing we'd ever do in life is to allow God to love you just as you are. Ephesians 2.10 says, you are his masterpiece. He created you the way you are with all your quirks and perks, your idiosyncrasies, your personality, with your big ears, with your big nose, with your whatever. He formed you. He fashioned you. He created you. And he loves you just the way you are. Even with the junk that you carry around in life, even if we say to yourself, how could God forgive me for what I've done? God loves you just the way you are, but he's not willing to leave you there. And when we begin to grasp this, and we need to take hold of the fact that our call, our primary calling is to be loved by God. It will literally transform our lives. Because there are so many of us, I heard last week, who don't believe they're good enough. They don't do enough. They don't measure up to some false, unrealistic, and unattainable standard that they, were, that they placed on themselves or their parents placed on them. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. If you don't know this verse, you should have this verse memorized. It says that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, things that come, nor powers, nor height, or death, anything else in all creation will be able to ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. There is nothing that you can do that will make God stop loving you. And our job is just literally to receive that gift. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says this, and I said this last week. See what great love the Father has lavished on. I mean, oozed, I mean, dripping. I mean, like, wow. Great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. You see, I am, you are, 
a child of God. And when we simply embrace and build our identity as his son, as his daughter, we begin to live in that calling. So imagine for me, if you would, what it could mean for Gloria Day and our communities, whatever we call that community, if everyone would embrace that. What would happen if every man, woman, and child at Gloria Day knew their calling and lived out their calling as a disciple of Jesus? Think about the kind of impact that could have in our communities, not just here at Gloria Day and not just in this neighborhood, but in your community. The spaces where you live, where you work, where you learn, where you play, where you gather. Think about what it would do for your marriage. Think about what it would do for your family. Think about what it would do for all your relationships at work. You know that guy in the cubicle next to you that gets on your every last nerve? Think about what it would do for you at school or, or while you're playing pickleball. So as we jump in, realize this. Every one of us have been called. Called to be loved by God. And how do I find that expression in my life? I'm called to be loved by God in this season of life, for me right now, to be a husband, to be a dad, to be a pastor, to be a son, to be a brother, an uncle, and maybe even one day a grandpa. And when we approach it from this perspective, it is not as much as what I do in those roles, but what I'm becoming in those roles. You see, when I take this approach, it helps me better understand life stages. At one point in my life, I had a calling to be a student, a son, even a construction worker. And one day, God willing, I will have a calling to be a retired pastor. And I'll have to figure out what that means. But I've already got a head start because I already know I've been called to be loved by God. And I don't have to put my identity in that I'm no longer a full-time working pastor. I am retired pastor, but I'm still loved by God. Here's what I truly believe. When God's people discover, know, and begin to live the reality that God has called them by his grace, it will permeate every aspect of their lives. And they come to a deeper realization that God is present at work in the day-to-day -day activities, the boring stuff. The stuff you get like, are you kidding me? Try taking kids to travel sports, to dance, to whatever schedule they've got. It broadens our perspective, helps us discover new possibilities that we can find meaning and purpose for our lives, that we can truly live fully alive in God's grace. Regardless of our age, our status, our giftedness, our personality, our looks, our role. So many times as we are trying to figure out what our calling is in life, I'm afraid that we complicate the process way too much. We ask, what's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? And how do I know I'm supposed what I'm supposed to do? Should I take this job? Should I move to another city? Should I fill the blanks? The very valid questions are ones we should all struggle with. But the problem is, myself included, I'm, I'm including myself in this, okay? We overcomplicate the process and literally forget that our calling, our first calling is to be loved by God and live in his grace. That God wants us to be rather than do. That the doing of our calling flows out of us being a child of God. Ephesians 2, chapter 8, 9, and 10. If you have your Bibles in front of you, you want to take it out, this is a verse you should know. I mean, this is like the Lutheran mantra right here. Okay? But this verse talks about our calling. It talks about our purpose. Ephesians chapter two, and I'll go with you. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's on page uh, 976. We're using the Bibles in front of you. Verse 8. Here's your calling. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is what? It's a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. This isn't about you doing. This is about you receiving. And then verse 10 is our purpose. Because of that, for we are his workmanship. Some translations say his masterpiece, his work of art. Created in Christ Jesus to do something for good works. And when did this start? which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should do. With that context, turn to Acts chapter 9. I'm telling you how good God is. This was not on my radar until yesterday afternoon. I had to rewrite my whole sermon. But it's good. I'm glad I did. I didn't like the other one. Let's just be honest. Acts chapter 9, it's on page um, 917. I am not going to go through this entire chapter, but I want you to understand the context of this chapter. Acts chapter 9 is a story of a guy named Saul. Saul is an incredible example of about discovering our calling and living it out. It's a story of a guy named Saul who was a religious nut. He was a Pharisee. And his job was to root out all of this new form brand called Christianity or followers of the way. And he literally would drag followers of Jesus outside of their homes and persecute them. In Acts chapter 9, you have the story of Saul, who later became Paul, who's confronted by God. He's blinded. And God says, why are you persecuting me and my people? I mean, it's just like... Everybody's in shock. Saul's brought to Damascus, and he's such in a funk. And so in awe, he stays there three days without eating, without drinking, blind. And then the Lord gives a vision by his spirit to this guy named Ananias. The vision is, you got to go to Saul and heal him. Ananias is freaked out. I get it. This is a guy that was persecuted and killing Christians. Look at Acts 9, verse 15. The Lord said to Ananias, go, for he, Saul, look at this, is what? A chosen instrument. This is the first announcement of Paul's call to proclaim Jesus to the world. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Saul is chosen. There's his calling a calling instrument of God's to do something, to carry the name for the Gentiles. So Ananias goes to Saul. Saul's vision is restored. Saul is baptized. He's strengthened. He eats. End of the story, not even close. Acts chapter 9, verse 19 tells us that Saul immediately, Saul's a guy I love because that dude's a type A. He just get her done. So now, now he knows this new thing, so he's been doing this thing. Now I'm going to go be zealous about this thing. And he gets busy doing stuff. New man, new passion, incredible zeal to preach Christ, not persecute Christ's followers. But I would argue Saul was not ready yet. And his timing was off because he started taking matters into his own hands. He wasn't awaiting God's call in his life. He was going to go figure it out on his own and go do his own thing. Acts 9.21. Here's what happens. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? I mean, folks don't get it. I don't blame them. You don't go from being Osama bin Laden to Billy Graham overnight. Look at verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength 
and he confounded the Jews. Like, what? Who is this guy who lived in the masses by proving that Jesus was the Christ? And the story, not even close. Saul, Saul, I would argue, still not living in his calling. If you continue reading, you'll see that Saul's former buddies plot to kill him. He escapes a murder plot, and then he goes and joins the disciples, but they're scared of him. And then there's this guy named Barnabas. Barnabas is the son of encouragement. He's, he's the encourager of Scripture. He shows up, sticks up for Saul, and tells all the disciples what happened. Look at verse 30. And when the brothers, the disciples learned this, they brought Saul down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. End of story? Nope. Saul goes silent. We don't know what happened, but in Scripture, from 9.30, Acts 9.30, turn to Acts 11.25. Well, Acts 11.25 is a span of at least eight plus years. The next time we hear about Saul is two chapters later when Barnabas is tasked to bring Saul back from Tarsus. Look at verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So he's been gone for eight plus years. Now look what happens. For a whole year. Dude, can we not get, what? Come on, let's go. Finally, they're bringing me. No, we need to wait. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And look at the result. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. For more than eight plus, 10 years after this massive road experience and that call of Acts 9 to 15, think about this, Saul, that chosen instrument of God is not active in God's mission. We don't know what Saul did. Scripture's silent. There's a lot of theories. But I would argue Saul, Paul, was sorting things out. You could call it a period of wondering where Paul was, or Saul was actually experimenting, dabbling in what, what he could do. What that illustrates for me is that oftentimes we tend to overcomplicate the process and we try to move on our timing, not God's. I want the answer today, yesterday. So please don't be upset with me when I tell you that knowing your calling and living your calling is not complicated, but it does require time. It requires people. It requires your unique giftedness, your story, your personality, your experiences, your core values, the things you're passionate about, so much more. But it is not difficult. It is resting in the fact that you've first been called by and loved by God to receive his grace and mercy to live as his child. You see, as his son, as his daughter, God is at work in that calling in the daily routines of our life for every man, woman, and child, regardless of our age or status or giftedness or personality or role. So here's how Gloria Day has put together some resources for us to start discovering what our calling can be and our purpose. We have a variety of tools here at Gloria Day. Now, we are across from NASA, so we get a pass on this. There's too many. We got so many different tools here at Gloria Day. We've got a thing called SHAPE. We've been using that for years. SHAPE is an acronym for what are your spiritual gifts, your heart, your, what you're passionate about, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. That's your SHAPE for ministry. We have a new thing called GPS, your giftedness, your passions, your story. And if you log into our database, it's a rock database, y'all. There's actually some pretty cool things there. We actually, you can take a disk profile. You can discover your emotional IQ. You can take a, 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 an inventory to find out what your motivators are. You can take another one of how you handle conflict and what are your spiritual gifts. 
Those are amazing tools, amazing resources that we have at our fingertips here, but they're not the process. They are a resource to help you in the process. In fact, Pastor Randy and Jason Phelps, our discipling director, have both put together one of their ministry goals for 2024 is to take all those tools, all those assessments, put them together in one platform that has an easy process for discovery. That sounds really hard. That's why I asked them to do it, not me. But they're smart guys. They're going to figure it out. I don't know how to work it out. The pressure's on. We'll, we'll do it together. So here are the three things that I see in this text that I believe are critical for us discovering our calling and purpose. The first one. I've been saying this over and over and over until you get it. Receive God's calling on your life to be his child. To live in his grace and mercy to know that God loves you just as you are. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says this, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, who are tired, burdened, and I'll give you rest. Come to me, he said, and receive my grace and love. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There's our purpose. Second one, be faithful. I mean, it sounds so simple. Bloom where you're planted, but go and try new things. Do the things that God has before you right now. Scripture says, Jesus said himself in Mark, Luke 16, 10, if you can be faithful with little, you can be trusted with much. You're not gonna be given all this other kind of responsibilities if you can't handle the one you're doing right now. You see, even if Paul meets Jesus, Saul, on the road to Damascus and preaches the gospel, people are still suspicious of him. And more than that, they're afraid of him. And some want to kill him. They're not sure how to proceed. So they send him off for a period of evaluation, training, learning, whatever it was. What was really happening? We don't know. But while we don't know, I believe Saul had one mission, that he literally woke up every day and he did the thing that God had for him that day. It sounds too easy. But think about this. The guy who would bring to the world the message of God's grace and forgiveness, the guy who wrote almost half of the New Testament, the guy who has transformed lives for eternity, a guy who'd come into communities and and raise up women and the orphans and bring health and healing to the gospel to entire communities that were subjected to Roman law and rule and hopelessness. Now, I'm not saying it has to take 10 plus years, but in the reality, Saul was faithful in that decade to the little things, and God then trusted him to much bigger things. So are you being faithful with what God has placed before you right now? Or are you always looking for something else? You realize the grass is greener on the other side of the fence because there's more cows pooping over there. Just saying. You know, you get that now. Are you faithful with God places before you? Or are you distracted by the 10% that seems to be more exciting? that pays more, that has more perks, that provides a bigger platform, or gives you an opportunity to be a social media influencer. I know I did. Well, not the social media influencer part. Too old. Some of you might know my story. Probably most of you don't. So let me share how I've lived this out. I grew up, both my mom and my dad were church workers. My dad was my principal. That was fun. And my mom was a teacher. She was my third grade teacher. So I vowed, I promised everyone I would never be a church worker. I knew it was something I could do, but I went Jonah on everybody, on God. But I was always involved in my church youth group. It did help that I liked this girl and she went every week. But I enjoyed serving in leadership and teaching and starting stuff. So then I went to the University of Texas at Austin for three semesters for all the wrong reasons. I enrolled in the business. I was a business major back then. 
I hate math. After three semesters, my love and joy of life was gone. I was defeated. I developed an ulcer. My grades were horrific. In fact, I was invited to consider another career path and to consider possibly another university. Yeah, I tell people I made the dean's list every year. It was just on the wrong end. Life had fallen apart for me. But just down the street in the old campus, there was this small Lutheran college called Concordia Lutheran College. And I enrolled in the elementary education program. Life immediately changed for me. I started following God's calling on my life. I love teaching. I love the kids. And I was pretty good at it, too. I student taught at St. Mark fifth grade here in Houston. And here's, here's where I believe the waiting part plays. During my middle school, high school, and college years, I, I, I dabbled in everything. I, I, I started a lawn mowing business. Who doesn't? I worked as a, at an electrical company at a commercial construction site. I did roofing. I laid asphalt. I was a salesman at the car wash at 59 in Kirby. I worked at a driving range. I was a waiter at Olive Garden. I served as a camp counselor at Camp Lone Star. I built playgrounds. I even got connected with the Houston Fire Department and started volunteering at Station 51. What was I doing? I was learning what I didn't want to do. So third step, discovering and knowing your call. Surround yourself with other godly believers and listen to their stories. While I was at school, learning new things, my Tarsus time, God started placing people and opportunities in front of me. Out of the blue, people would come up to me and ask me if I ever thought about being a pastor. I talked with my pastor and he said, dude, enroll. Well, he didn't say dude, but he said, God will close doors if you're not supposed to go. And what's crazy, not only did I get admitted past the application deadline, but that was the first year the admissions office admitted students without any pre-seminary credits. Doors kept opening. So as you discern your calling and what to do, allow others to speak into what they see in you and experience in you. Figure out your spiritual gifts, your, your heart, your passion, your abilities, your personality type, your experience. Figure out your personal core values and then share that with those around you what God keeps placing in front of you. Because God is using them to help you know and to understand his call on your life and how you can begin living it out. Think about this, Acts chapter 13, there's a verse in there. The church at Antioch was having a worship meeting. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after praying and fasting, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. There are people in your life who are going to speak truth to you. Man, I'm not following my timing, sorry. I'm telling you, other people are going to help you in this decision. I remember my eighth grade teachers at Pilgrim Lutheran School. He had to turn a list of people who he thought would be great pastors. I was at his desk one day, and I happened to see my name on the top of the list. I said, what is that? Mr. Nelson, my high school youth director, asked me one day about being a pastor. I said, no. Professor Norris Patsky at Concordia Lutheran College, even when I had a designated call to teach fifth grade in a school in New Jersey, maybe that was the reason, asked if I would ever consider being a pastor. Steve Cash is my my boss that I had for a long time building playgrounds, he would speak truth and life into me every day, all those summer breaks and school breaks. So I graduated from Concordia Lutheran College, CTX, with an elementary education degree, a Lutheran diploma, Lutheran teacher diploma, woohoo, and enrolled in seminary. And even in those, I still believe I was still in Tarsus. The two congregations I served previously to Glory Day, 
God was preparing me for Gloria Day. My vicarage supervisor told me that I should serve a large church. I didn't know what that meant. I enrolled in a leadership thing called PLI, Pastoral Leadership Institute. And we were blessed to visit large churches and sit at the feet of the senior pastor and learn from incredible pastors all over the country. In fact, I was blessed to learn from and become very good friends with an amazing senior pastor at some humongous church in Houston, Texas, called Gloria Day. John Kieschnick taught me, shared his time and life with me. He invested in me. And 20 years later, I stand before you as a senior pastor of Gloria Day Lutheran Church. I share that with you not because this journey is more than just knowing my spiritual gifts. It sure helped. It's more about knowing my personality or my abilities, my passions, my experiences. Those were great. It was about being faithful. It was about being called to be loved by God. And it was to listen to other people who were seeing things in me that I couldn't see in myself. I'll leave with this final thought. Bring the band up. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he was 30 years old. He gathered 12 ordinary, uneducated, rough, and tough band of followers. They didn't have any supernatural or natural talents and abilities. They were not renowned for scholarly works. They had no track record of public speaking. They didn't go to the seminary. They were full of mistakes, misstatements, wrong attitude, lapses of faith. They were bitter failures. But they are real, living characters that we can identify with. These disciples became the instruments by which the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified was carried to the ends of earth. So I'll ask you again. Imagine, dream with me. Let's put it into practice. If every man, woman, and child at Gloria Day would know and would live their calling as a disciple of Jesus to impact their community so that others will live fully alive in God's grace. May God grant that to each of us for Jesus' sake. To God alone be the glory.